Hello everybody, this is Neelam Path Lectures, the Pursue series, and I'm Dr. Nadeem. All our lectures are available on YouTube. You can join the Telegram group to access all lecture-related information. We have a Google Drive where the PDF of all lectures are available. These are the disclaimers. We are with Phase 3, which is Recorded Pathology Lectures. Today we have Pursue 15Q, which is Hematology Erythrocytic Disorder. And we are streaming from Unipath Speciality Lab, Kolkata. The topic of the day is meth hemoglobinemia and dyshemoglobinemia. And to talk on that, we have Dr. Abhishek Mukherjee, who is an MBBS from CNMCH, MD Pathology for RMC. He is a lab director in Unipath Speciality Lab, Kolkata. He has been associated with several reputed hospitals and laboratories in the past 14 years, including SRL, Suraksha, and Onquist Lab. His areas of interest in cytopathology and hematopathology and oncopathology. I would request Dr. Abhishek Mukherjee to start his lecture on meth hemoglobinemias and dyshemoglobinemias. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Abhishek Mukherjee, Senior Consultant Pathologist and Laboratory Director of Unipath Speciality Laboratories, Kolkata. Today, my topic of discussion is on meth hemoglobinemia and other dyshemoglobinemias which we encounter in the clinical practice. In today's topic, I'm going to talk predominantly on the methemoglobinemia, the definition, the pathogenesis, different etiological factors, the different infant susceptibility factors about hemoglobin M, the clinical presentation, laboratory investigations, the treatment protocol. And in other dyshemoglobinemias, I'll be speaking about sulfimoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. Methemoglobinemia is basically a functional anemia which results from the disruption of the ability of hemoglobin to transport oxygen efficiently, leading to a low oxygen concentration in the blood, giving rise to a purplish or bluish discoloration of the skin, which is cyanosis. Pathogenesis of methemoglobinemia is due to the oxygenation of the heme in the hemoglobin by reactive oxygen species such as superoxide or peroxide ions, where the iron in the heme group is being oxidized from the ferrous to the ferric state. This oxidized heme group is unable to bind reversibly with the oxygen molecule, rendering the RBCs incapable of transporting oxygen efficiently to the body tissues. This leads to a shift in the oxygen dissociation curve. To the Coming to the different etiological factors, initially I'll be talking about the hereditary factors. The first and foremost is the cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency. So cytochrome B5 reductase, which is also known as the NADH diaphoris, it catalyzes a step in the major pathway of meth hemoglobin reduction. This enzyme reduces the substrate cytochrome B5 using NADH as a hydrogen donor. The reduced cytochrome B5 in turn reduces methemoglobin to hemoglobin. As a result, a steady state of methemoglobin level is achieved where the rate of formation of methemoglobin by this reactive oxygen species is being equalized by the rate of methemoglobin reduction. A marked diminution in the activity of the cytochrome B5 reductase will lead to accumulation of the brown pigment in the cell. The inheritance of this cytochrome B5 reductase is by an autosomal recessive fashion and can be divided into three distinct groups. The type 1 disease, where the cytochrome B5 reductase is restricted to the RBCs can give rise to methemoglobinemia. In case of type 2 cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency, which accounts for 10 to 15% of the disease, here the enzyme deficiency is distributed to all the cells of the body. So in addition to methemoglobinemia, we have severe developmental abnormalities. Infants generally present with progressive encephalopathy and mental retardation and they die within one year of life. The third entity, which is com comparatively rare than the other two entities, is the type 3, where the cytochrome B5 reductase is restricted to the non-erythroid cells. 
but surprisingly, patients do not suffer any neurological. We also get some heterozygotes of cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency. And these heterozygotes are generally clinically stable. They do not have methemoglobinemia or cyanosis. However, if you administer certain drugs, which in normal individuals induces slight clinically unimportant methemoglobinemia, in such patients, it gives rise to severe cyanosis. In this context, we should also talk about the deficiency of the site of the substrate cytochrome B5. So as we have seen that a reduced cytochrome B5 helps in reduction of methemoglobin hemoglobin. So a deficiency of cytochrome B5 will lead to a similar manifestation as cytochrome B5 reductase. A balance, another sub protein that we should talk about is an antioxidant protein 2. It's a member of peroxyredoxin protein family which binds with hemoglobin and prevents both a spontaneous and oxidant-induced methemoglobin formation. Mutation in the genes which encode this protein give rise to a congenital and acquired methemoglobin. We also have an entity called toxic methemoglobinemia where certain drugs and toxic chemicals, they accelerate the process of heme hemoglobin oxidation from the ferrous to the ferric state. The drugs include sulfonamides, lidocaine, and other aniline derivatives. The most common offenders include benzocaine and lidocaine. Nitrates and nitrites can also contaminate water supplies or used as preservatives in food can also act as an offending agent. Infants who are susceptible to methemoglobinemia can have the following reasons for this condition. As we have discussed, the cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency, which happens because the activity of this enzyme is normally low in newborn infants, making them susceptible to develop methemoglobinemia. And there's an increased hemoglobin oxidation and decreased methemoglobin reduction. Use of certain toxic materials, such as aniline dyes, which are used for diapers, and ingestion of nitrate contaminated water or beans. Bacterial action in the intestinal tract reduces nitrate to nitrite, which in turn causes methemoglobinemia. In rural areas, still infants drinking water, which are contaminated with nitrate, can give rise to a fatal myth hemoglobin. The third cause for methemoglobinemia in infants is inhalation of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is used as a line of treatment for pulmonary hypertension because of its vasodilatory effect on the pulmonary vessels. During the binding and release of nitric oxide with hemoglobin, methemoglobin is formed at a higher rate. Methemoglobinemia is sometimes seen in acidotic infants with diarrhea. In such patients, the activity of red cell cytochrome B5 reductase remains normal and the exact mechanism of methemoglobinemia in such patients is unknown. Now let us discuss what is hemoglobin M. Heme as we know is held in a hydrophobic heme pocket between the E and F alpha helices of each of the four globin chains. The iron atom in the heme forms four bonds with the pyral nitrogen atom of the porphyrin ring and a fifth covalent bond with the imidazole nitrogen of the histidine ratio. This histidine residue, 87 in the alpha chain or 92 in the beta chain, is designated as a proximal histidine. On the opposite side of this porphyrin ring, the iron atom lies adjacent to another histidine residue which is situated at position 58 in the alpha chain and position 63 in the beta chain and is known as the distal histidine and is not covalently bonded. Now, under normal circumstances, when oxygen is discharged from the red blood cells from the heme pocket, sometimes the oxygen is occasionally discharged as superoxide anion. And in this process, it removes an electron from the iron, making it from ferrous to ferric state. 
in most of the hemoglobin M, there's a tyrosine which substitutes each of the proximal of the distal histidine. Tyrosine in turn forms an iron phenolate complex that resists the reduction of the iron from the ferric to the ferrous state. Four hemoglobin M are a consequence of the substitution of tyrosine for histidine in the proximal and distal sites of the alpha. Another hemoglobin M, which is known as hemoglobin M milochi, is formed by the substitution of glutamic acid for valine in the 67th residue of the beta chain. The glutamic acid side chain points towards the heme group and its gamma carboxyl group interacts with the iron atom and prevents the iron from being reduced from ferric to ferrous. The cyanosis which results from abnormal hemoglobin like hemoglobin M is generally inherited in an autosome. Coming to the clinical manifestation of this disease, so in cases of patients where methemoglobinemia is seen due to drug ingestion, it can present either in chronic or acute form or acquired or congenital. Acquired severe acute methemoglobinemia can produce symptoms of anemia as the methemoglobin lacks the capacity to transport oxygen. The symptoms that we commonly see are like shortness of breath, palpitations, and vascular collapse. Chemicals which are inducing methemoglobinemia can also cause lysis of the red blood cells. So we have a combination of hemolytic anemia and methemoglobinemia. Now, in cases of chronic methemoglobinemia, due to exposure of drugs and toxins, the patients are usually asymptomatic. In cases of hemoglobin M, patient manifests with cyanosis. Now, as we have seen, there are two types of variants. There's an alpha globin variant and a beta globin variant. In cases of alpha globin variants, the presentation occurs in infants and they present a dusky color. This will be noted at the time of birth. But the clinical manifestation in beta globin variant is delayed because the beta chains takes time to replace the fetal gamma chain. So usually the manifestation of beta globin variant is seen after six to nine months of age. In spite of this impaired hemoglobin formation, we generally do not see any cardiopulmonary symptoms and there is no clubbing. In cases of cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency, as we have discussed previously, the infants present with mental retardation, failure to thrive. Now, what are the laboratory features of these different types of methemoglobinemia? So in toxic methemoglobinemia, we get an elevated level of methemoglobin level, but the activity of cytochrome B5 reductase remains normal. So how do you measure the methemoglobin? So the methemoglobin level is measured by a method known as evelyn malloy method, where you add cyanide, which causes reduction of methemoglobin to cyanmethamine. And the change in absorbance of methemoglobin at 630 nanometer is measured by direct spectrophotometric analysis. The absorption of methemoglobin at this wavelength disappears when it is converted to sign methyl. In cases of cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency, around 8 to 40 percent of the hemoglobin is in the form of methemoglobin. The residual level of the enzyme activity is usually less than 20 percent of normal. The blood may have a chocolate brown color and patient have a cyanosis. The cytochrome B5 reductase activity is measured by use of rate of oxidation of NADH using phase cyanide. As now, in patients where the cytochrome B5 reductase activity is normal and we do not get any hemoglobin, where hemoglobin M has been ruled out, we go for assays for cytochrome B5 to rule out if there is any deficiency of the substrate cytochrome B5 for the methemoglobinemia. In cases of hemoglobin M, it may be differentiated from methemoglobin by its absorption spectrum. 
which is in the range of 450 to 750 nanometer. But since some 20 to 35 percent of the total hemoglobin is converted to hemoglobin M, we get a mixed spectra of both with hemoglobin A and hemoglobin M, making it difficult to interpret. So how do we it is preferable to perform a spectral study on purified hemoglobin M and it's purified or extracted by an electrophoretic or chromatographic means. The electrophoresis is generally performed at pH 7.1. At this pH, the imidazole group of histidine has a net positive charge and hence it becomes easier to separate this hemoglobin M. While at a higher pH level, the histidines and the substituted tyrosines are coming to the treatment and course of the disease. In acute toxic methemoglobinemia is a serious medical emergency. When the level of the pigment exceeds one third of the total circulating hemoglobin, acute methemoglobinemia becomes life threatening because there's a loss of oxygen carrying capacity of the blood and also a left shift of the oxygen dissociation curve. When the level of methemoglobin exceeds 50% of the total pigment, you have a vascular collapse, coma, and death. The preferred line of treatment is the use of methylene blue. Now, methylene blue is reduced to leukomethylene blue by using NADPH, which is formed in the hexose monophosphate pathway. This reduced leukomethylene blue, in turn, non enzymatically, reduces methemoglobin to hemoglobin. Now, for deficit of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, this should not be treated with methylene blue. So it's very important to rule out if there is any deficiency of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. In this subject, methylene blue would not only fail to give any desired effect, it will compound a patient's difficulty by inducing an acute hemolytic episode or increasing the level of methemoglobin. In patients with acute toxic methemoglobinemia who are symptomatic or whose methemoglobin level is rapidly rising, there we inject one to two milligram of intravenous methylene blue over a period of five minutes and it gives a very rapid action. There will be marked lowering or even sometimes normalization of methemoglobin level within an hour or two. In hereditary methemoglobinemia, which is resulting due to some enzyme deficiency or some protein deficiency, they are generally have a benign course of action. And patients with disorder, they should be shielded from exposure to these aniline derivatives and nitride, which can precipitate methemoglobinemia in hereditary methemoglobinemia. Hereditary methemoglobinemia resulting from cytochrome B5 reductase deficiency are generally treated with ascorbic acid. It's given 300 to 600 milligram orally daily, divided into three to four doses. Although intravenous administration of methylene blue has been found to be effective, riboflavin administration seems to benefit. Iron phenolate complex, which is formed in hemoglobin M, prevents the reduction of ferric to ferrocyan. For this reason, methemoglobinemia does not respond to administration of either ascorbic acid or methylene blue. So no effective treatment exists in such patients. Coming to the other dyshemoglobinemias, the first I'll be talking about the self hemoglobin. Now self hemoglobin is a hemoglobin derivative which has a characteristic absorption spectrum of 620 nanometer. It derives its name as it can be produced in vitro by the action of hydrogen sulfide on hemoglobin. Now, self hemoglobin have one excess sulfur atom. The sulfur atom appears to bind with the beta pyrrole carbon atom at the periphery of the porphyrin ring. There are certain drugs whose ingestion can lead to self hemoglobinemia, like sulfonamides, phenacetine, acetinolide, and phenazopyridine. Some patients with self hemoglobinemia or a past history of this disorder appears to have an increased level of red cell reduced glutathione level. The drugs trigger elevation of red cell glutathione level either by activating the enzyme glutathione synthetase 
or by increasing intracellular glucometry. So what are the clinical features? It's characterized by cyanosis. Drugs that causes self hemoglobinemia can also accelerate red cell destruction or hemolysis. Thus, mild hemolysis is sometimes observed in patients with self hemoglobinemia. Blood self hemoglobin is detected in the lysate of blood treated with ferricyanide, cyanide, and ammonia. And comparing the optical density at 620 nanometer with that at 540 nanometer. So, what is the treatment and course of action? The self hemoglobin. Mia is a benign disorder, and unlike methemoglobin, it does not produce a left shift in the oxygen dissociation curve, but in turn, it decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Some other abnormal hemoglobin associated with low oxygen affinity are like HBC and HB cancers. Coming to the next dyshemoglobinemia, the carboxyhemoglobin, which results from inhalation of carbon monoxide. As we know, carbon monoxide is a deadly gas because it is an odorless, colorless, and tasteless gas. Chronic carbon monoxide intoxication is commonly caused in patients in people with cigarette smoking, which can increase the carboxyhemoglobin level by up to 15%. Houses with defective heating exhaust system and vehicles that leave carbon monoxide into the passenger compartment can lead to carboxyhemoglobinemia. Now, certain occupations which carry increased risk to carbon monoxide intoxications, this include garage work with improper ventilation, toll booth attendants, tunnel workers, and fire. What is the pathogenesis that happens? The carbon monoxide binds with high affinity with heme. This affinity for hemoglobin is approximately 240 times greater than that of oxygen. This phenomenon of carbon monoxide gives rise to a darling rutan effect. As a result of increased affinity of carbon monoxide for hemoglobin, there is extraordinary slow release process and it produces a high affinity constant of carbon monoxide for him. Once two molecules of carbon monoxide has bound with the hemoglobin molecule, it switches to a relaxed or the relaxed state. This relaxed hemoglobin now in turn increases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Now hemoglobin oxygen binds irreversibly with the hemoglobin molecule and the oxygen delivery to the tissue is reduced. And this phenomenon increases with increase in the carbon monoxide. Certain other causes for increased endogenous level of carbon monoxide. So sometimes seeing that calorie restriction, dehydration, infancy, and genetic variations can lead to carboxyhemoglobinemia. Fetuses and newborns have been found to have a carboxyhemoglobin level to double to the normal adult level, which is around 1 to 2 percent. Drugs such as diphenylhydantoin and phenobarbital by inducing the cytochrome P450 complex increases the carbon C. Carbon what are the clinical features and laboratory features? Carbon monoxide poisoning should be remembered is a more of a clinical diagnosis and the laboratory investigation is just for confirmatory test. In acute intoxication with carbon monoxide, we have central, which affects the central and peripheral nervous system and derangement of cardiopulmonary functions. Cerebral edema is common, so is impairment of the peripheral nervous system. Carbon monoxide can also increase the capillary permeability and precipitate acute pulmonary. Acute carbon monoxide intoxication in children gives a unique symptomatology which resembles gastroenteritis. Surviving children are more likely to have a severe sequel such as leukoencephalopathy and severe myocardial ischemia. Chronic intoxication in adults might result in irritability, nausea, lethargy, headache, and sometimes flu like conditions. Higher carboxyhemoglobin levels produce somnolence, palpitations, cardiomegaly, and hypertension, and even can contribute to atherosclerosis of my presentation of today.
Thank you, everyone.